Hello, everyone, uh, wherever you are, and uh, welcome to our ninth uh, Inquiry Talks. Uh, the webinars we aim to connect our membership uh, with a broader global tertiary education and quality assurance community to discuss today's issues related to quality assurance. And we are very pleased uh, to bring together international experts, practitioners to share in insights, challenges, best practice to ensure that uh, tertiary education and quality assurance continue to serve their best our increasingly connected communities. My name is Fabrice Inar, and I'm the CEO of Inquahi, and uh, I will have the pleasure to chair this uh, session. Today's uh, topic relates to micro-credentials and recognitions. Micro-credentials are uh, emerging as a transformative force uh, in tertiary education, opening up a world of opportunities, but while also carrying inherent risks, and we will address those issues today. If you're not uh, yet familiar with uh, INQUAHI, the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education, uh, INQUAHI has been established in 1991 and is composed of more than 300 organizations, active in theory and practice of quality assurance. And uh, it includes organizations in charge of external quality assurance, as well as tertiary institution educations and some individuals spanning all continents. Our key strategic orientations consist in serving the interest of the community of quality assurance and tertiary education, fostering research and evidence-based analysis, enhancing confidence in quality assurance and recognition of quality assurance, and above all, helping our community to be more impactful on the quality of tertiary education and on student lives. So for this purpose, Inquiry offers to members a range of services, including conferences, forums, webinars like this one, funding for projects in capacity building and research, external reviews of quality assurance agencies, technical assistance, and more to come in terms of capacity building activities specifically. So Inquiry today feels particularly privileged to host uh, this uh, Inquiry Talks on micro-credentials. Indeed, last year, we published the International Standards and Guidelines, or ISG, which aim to provide benchmarks for members who conduct external assessments, QA agencies. And we are about to launch our first external evaluation of agencies against these IEGs. And we have developed a module specific on short uh, professional programs and micro-credentials. So this uh, will allow the evaluated agencies to benefit from the recommendations of our experts and to move forward with greater confidence and professionalism in the field of micro-credentials, which is multiplying everywhere. The question of quality and validity, and therefore recognition of micro-credentials has become central in recent years as our community seeks to adapt its methods. On the other hand, we also, as, as inquiry, gain experience through recent research, such as uh, the one conducted with UNESCO on micro-credentials in the Asia-Pacific regions. And we uh, examine the extent to which uh, eight countries in those regions try to build trust in these new programs and certifications. So the subjects on micro-credential is vast, but our aim in these inquiry talks is to better understand why and through what processes micro-credentials have been developed around the world, allowing us to put into perspectives experiences from different regions of the world, North America through Ontario and Canada, Asia through Hong Kong, China and Japan, and finally the European higher education perspective. Rather than a series of presentations, we decided to have a, a conversation modality among our panelists to make this webinar more livelier, less linear. After all, we are all learning on how to improve and ensure the quality of, of micro-credentials as well as their recognition. And it's not a case of one side being the knowledgeable experts with their academic theories and the other side being the practitioners in their institutions. It's the harmonious combination of points of view drawn from diverse experience that will enable us all together to identify what works and how to make it work. So um, to accompany us in these discussions, we have brought together four top quality panelists, Dr. Christina N, 
senior register at the Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications. Dr. Esther Ruetas, Head of Quality Assurance Department at ACU, Catalonia, Spain. Dr. Ray Mori, Professor at the National Institution for Academic Degree and Quality Enhancement of Higher Education, Japan. And Dr. Marek Catherine Lennon, Head of Research and Special Projects at the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board of Ontario, Canada. So the webinar will, will be structured as follows. We will start with an introduction to micro-credentials by Mary Kathleen Lennon, followed by insights into the Ontario framework for, for, for micro-credentials. Then we'll have an, a presentation and understanding of the context uh, in which micro-credentials have been developed in the different ge geographical zones. Then we will continue with a set of questions and answers that I will have with our panelists, and then I will open the chat to our participants. So we will have enough time to uh, uh, collect your questions. So a few words about housekeeping. So we have muted all your microphones to help you with the smooth running of the events and your cameras have been also disabled, but we're keen to uh, hear uh, from you. And uh, this is intended to be an interactive seminar. And uh, this is why you can use the Q&A function to ask your questions um, during, the pre during the discussions with the panelists or after during, during the Q&A section. Please try to use the Q&A uh, uh, text box uh, and, and, and not the one that the chat box that we're using to introduce ourselves. It will, it will help us to identify your, your questions. And I will identify the recurrent ones and I will uh, address them to uh, our uh, uh, panelists. So without uh, further ado, I'm excited to kick off this webinar and uh, turn it over to Mary Catherine Lennon. Please, Mary Kath. Hey, thank you so much, Fabrice. It's a pleasure to be here today. And um, yeah, very much looking forward to the, to the conversation. I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, and I'm going to take a few minutes just at the outset, is if, um, if everyone can see that. Just, just to sort of set the stage for what many of us are going to speak about today in, in our presentations about what our jurisdictions have been going through and things that we've been considering and working on, the, the key considerations, the key concepts and, and controversies that are shaping the regulatory landscape for micro-credentials. It's issues such as just the, the vast expansion of short programming, which has been in existence for decades, centuries even, for labor market purposes, for upskilling purposes, and even for general interest purposes. So recognizing that micro-credentials in essence are not new, but the expectations of what micro-credentials can do and what short programs can do is really what sort of brought them to the fore in the past 10 years, where there's a desire for them to, <clears throat> pardon me, it's very early in my morning, <clears throat> Um, there is a desire for them to, um, to support linkages between labor markets and education. There's a desire for them to support upskilling and reskilling for industries that are changing as, as we're well into the, the 21st century. We're seeing dramatic changes in, in industries and um, in employment opportunities. We also see that the, um, the, the desire for micro-credentials is to support lifelong learning and to really have the, um, the student's educational experience, learning experience recognized so that there's the ability to take short programming and have it valued for academic purposes at some point, so-called stacking, so that no part of a student's um, educational experience needs to be redone or needs to be um, ignored. The, um, the other component that many of these jurisdictions have been working through have been issues of uh, providers. Public institutions, private institutions of higher, further vocational education are traditional education providers and training providers. But with micro-credentials, we definitely see um, alternate providers where 
employers and industry and community associations and professional associations are deeply involved in serving their communities and have been for a long time. And a question of how do we recognize that level of training and integrate that into the higher education landscape for recognition purposes, for credit transfer issues, or for credit transfer purposes is something that jurisdictions are, are certainly working through. And no doubt you'll you'll hear from each of the presentations today about whether or not quality um, or pardon me qualifications frameworks have been involved in the regulation or um, planned system for micro credentials. And we'll definitely talk about external quality assurance and internal quality assurance at the institutions um, and how they're grappling with issues of development quality assurance and recognition. Because that recognition piece is, is certainly the crux of many of the um, controversies and questions about micro-credentials, particularly when provided by alternate providers, I say alternate, the industries, the private um, professional associations, et cetera. M making sure that, that students have their educational experience recognized and transportable, portable to the labor market and or um, further education. That that piece is really is really critical to micro credentials, and um, and is something that we've we've all been working through. So um, so I just wanted to to set the stage with with those elements so that um, that you know that these are the things that we're all working through when we when we are developing our jurisdictional activities. And so now I'm going to turn to the Ontario case. Thank you. I, if I can, thank you. Um, so in Ontario, we are at a point right now where micro credentials are certainly something that the government is interested in. Uh, for the past three years, they've invested millions of dollars um, in areas of supporting institutions, supporting providers to develop micro-credentials. There is student assistance for micro-credentials. Um, the government in the end of 2022, early 2021, came to my agency at the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board and asked if we would develop a proposal uh, and give them advice on what a quality assurance framework for micro-credentials could look like. And so we have spent the past, um, however many months, nine months now, um, working very hard to create something collaboratively with our, with our sector and stakeholder partners to develop something that we think is going to be supportive of the variety of elements that, um, that I just discussed. There is a white paper out currently for consultation. It is open until the uh, the end of this month, but the paper itself will be available. The idea at this point is that we are seeking feedback from our partners so that we can provide the best advice to the government on how we can reasonably integrate micro-credentials into the higher education landscape. So our real problem was that there was a lack of clarity about what a micro-credential was. We had so many expectations about what it could be. We had problems about what we'll call the jungle of credentials. Micro-credentials could be anything from a one-hour seminar to a 250-hour, 300-hour course. And there was no way of distinguishing what was what. The other problem is there was no way of distinguishing what level the education was targeted at. A micro-credential could have the exact same title, and one could be a very basic um, entry-level exploration of the topic, or it could be a program that is designed for experts who are in the field, who already have graduate training, who are looking for very precise programming. And our current situation is that there's no clear mechanism to signal what we're talking about when we talk about any given micro-credential. The, the similar parallel issue is that it's a wild west of providers. Anyone can provide anything and call it a micro-credential. And there's nothing wrong with that. We can't change that. But the problems that that creates is that the onus is on the student to presume the value of the investment in the experience. And it requires after the fact judgment by the employer or industry or academic institution to determine if 
they see value in it, if they can award the student or the employee um, recognition for that. And so our main problem that we, we sort of landed on was we're looking for some sort of formal recognition of programming that will provide the students with clarity of options, confidence and recognition, and validation of their educational investment. And so our solution it was to create a protected term, an Ontario mm -hmm. micro-credential. It's a legally protected term that's applicable to some micro-credentials. Micro-credentials as a term is wide open. Anyone can continue and will continue to provide them, but some can be protected. And those that are protected, um, what it does is it signals rigor. It signals that there is clear definition on duration, signals that it's been provided by certain providers, that it's um, accessible, well, accessible to a variety of providers, and that stackability is possible and can be signaled. The strategy for the Ontario Microcredential Quality Framework is to create a qualifications framework to then support our five, we have five quality assurance, four quality assurance agencies with a fifth that's responsible for our privates, um, four quality assurance agencies to support them in their assessment and support for internal quality assurance processes. And then finally support our um, our recognition processes of which we have many in Ontario. Um, I feel that I'm probably, and I've probably taken enough time and I do hope to continue the conversation um, with you, but that's just sort of a, a sense of what we're doing here in Ontario. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary Kat. Thank you. Um, uh, now we are uh, leaving Canada and uh, we will head to uh, Hong Kong, China with uh, Christina. Please, Christina, Hi. go to you. Thank you. So let me just uh, share my screen. Um, Okay, there we go. Um, so thank you very much. Um, this is a uh, good afternoon from Hong Kong and uh, I'm from HKCA VQ, which stands for Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications. Now, uh, I have to spell out the name because uh, it indicates that uh, we cover both the academic sector and also the vocational sector. Um, now, this is my uh, my my favorite uh, my favorite uh, mind map uh, on micro credentials, and in fact, um, there are three crucial questions here. The first is, uh, um, what are they? So we need to think about, you know, uh, maybe we need a definition. And uh, then the second question, why are they important? Then we need to consider uh, what are the purposes? Uh, what are the needs for these, um, uh, for micro-credentials in Hong Kong? Um, then we have the question about whether that is new. So we need to review our existing provisions to see whether we have anything uh, developed already, and what else do we need to do? And uh, the last one, the third question, so how do they relate to traditional qualifications? Now, that means whether we have a uh, mechanism or sufficient mechanisms for um, credit transfer for the stacking of uh, these uh, small qualifications. Now, at this stage, I would like uh, to use the most uh, simple understanding of micro-credential. So micro, small, focused, short, and uh, flexible in the delivery, more accessible, more affordable. And credentials means that they are quality assured. Uh, there should be transparent information about the qualifications. And, and credential, being credentials, these are recognized and uh, quality, assured, quality assured. So we ask ourselves, are these uh, new in Hong Kong? Well, yes and no. 
And uh, before that, uh, we may probably look at the uh, quali qualifications framework in Hong Kong. We already have the framework um, for a long time. And uh, on this qualifications framework, we have seven levels already. And uh, each level is uh, defined by the generic level descriptors in four domains. And so with that, all kinds of qualifications, academic, vocational, continuing education can be put or can be recognized under the qualifications framework as long as they meet the accreditation requirements uh, of HKCAVQ or they are self-accrediting um, universities, they have their internal QA mechanism. So all the qualifications recognized are put on the uh, QR, the qualifications register. So you can see here we have the qualification, the types of qualifications uh, on the QR. And uh, on the left, those are uh, color shaded. These are the formal qualifications. Uh, that means they have um, uh, they are specified with the QF level and also the the size. But all the rest are what we call other qualifications. And uh, there are mainly two types, diploma and certificate. Uh, for a program to be called diploma, it has to be at least 60 QF credits, um, you know, in terms of the size. And uh, there are, I mean, that is uh, roughly equivalent to one year full-time study. And one QF credit uh, equals to 10 notional learning hours. So that's uh, how we define the, the credits. Um, so let's see the uh, the the qualifications uh, on the QF uh, on the QR. We can see that actually, uh, if we draw a line at uh, at uh, sixty credits, then uh, we can see that um, you know half of the qualifications on the QR are short qualifications in the sense, and among this half, among this four thousand plus. 92% of them are less than 30 credits. That means even shorter. And uh, we have the, uh, you know, if we look at the uh, QF level of these short qualifications, 99% uh, belong to QF level one to four. So in other words, we have a large number of uh, short qualifications developed and they are mostly uh, lower level uh, programs. So how do we facilitate them to be recognized under the, um, you know, uh, into the formal qualification or into the uh, formal education sector? So that is probably the issue. And um, so here we can see that we have the formal qualifications on the left-hand side and the other qualifications on the right-hand side. And so the issue is to unbundle the formal qualifications to make it uh, modular, uh, more accessible, more flexible, more uh, uh, easier for for learners to um, to access. But at the same time, we need uh, mechanisms to facilitate them or facilitate all these uh, other qualifications into the formal qualifications. So that would be the main issue that we have here. And if we look at the provider list, we can see that Actually, 84% of the uh, short qualifications are in fact provided by nine uh, providers. And among these nine, seven of them are universities. And, uh, and also at the same time, we have two very large or key uh, providers for vocational programs. So in other words, actually most of the short qualifications are vocational programs. Um, so we may say, well, this is uh, like a small circle, and uh, is it easy to facilitate transfer or recognition among them? Well, uh, in Hong Kong, we do have uh, the, uh, the policy for credit accumulation and transfer. We call it CAT policy, but these policies are voluntary, so it's up to the institution to, to adopt it or not. And um, under the policy, there are eight principles. Um, so these are basic principles like, uh, uh, you know, promoting learner 
mobility, transparency, and so on. Then we look at the reality. Now, the reality is that although we have the principles, we have the policy, but the take-up rate is not uh, satisfactory. So among all the qualifications, we can see that 65% of them do not have any CAT arrangement so far. And even for those that have the CAT arrangement, you know, most of them are just institutional policy. That means uh, in principle that they will adopt uh, or they will um, accept credit transfer. And the actual re implementation, that means having the um, detailed arrangement for uh, credit transfer in, uh, in the program, there are only about 3.5%. Uh, so we still have uh, a lot to work on. And we, um, so we, we ask the providers, we, we see, you know, what happened. So we interview 12 providers. And first of all, we ask them, are, are they interested in the development of micro-credentials? And also what are their plans? So, uh, you know, almost 100% uh, response told us that they are very positive. They are very interested. And they have uh, a lot of, you know, different plans uh, like unbundle the modules, uh, adopting modular design in programs and uh, creating articulation pathways and so on. And they also wanted to strengthen their internal guidelines for credit transfer. They wanted um, more partnership with uh, industry and uh, also cross institutional uh, transfer. But they also tell us that they have some concern. For example, uh, they know that, uh, you know, the uh, policy issues, uh, including, um, you know, a lack of uh, definition on, on micro-credentials, uh, you know, they, uh, the stacking rules are not clear, and uh, the recognition of uh, online programs or non-formal learning is not clear, public awareness on micro-credentials is not high, and uh, they also need support. Uh, our support uh, on program design for the consistency of program uh, or modules, and particularly on how to evaluate uh, qualifications across institutions, how to assign credits. And uh, at the same time, they also wanted to know what are the EQA requirements. That means what are, whether you know, there will be uh, specific um, quality assurance requirements from HKCA, AVQ. And uh, of course, they wanted to see the accreditation process shorter, faster, cheaper. So these are their, um, you know, their concern. And at this stage, uh, we see our the direction of our development is that we basically, we have some infrastructure developed. So we will leverage the existing uh, QF uh, framework and also the QA system. Uh, but at the same time, we will um, strengthen that in four particular areas. The, uh, we will define micro-credentials in terms of the credits and the levels. And uh, for the uh, qualification registrar, we should enhance it to provide more transparency, more detailed uh, information on it. And also, uh, we need to think about, you know, our um, EQA, our accreditation requirements, see whether, you know, how we can streamline the process uh, to, uh, to, to cater for the, you know, the, the, the fast development of uh, micro-credentials. So uh, I would like to stop here and uh, we have a long way to go, but I think we are moving forward steadily. And um, the thing we need, we have in mind, uh, always bear in mind is that uh, we have to cater for the needs of all different stakeholders, including the providers, the learners, the employees, employers. Um, so I stop here and uh, I'm, I'm happy to further discuss uh, in the uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much for your comprehensive presentations. Thank you. I immediately pass over to Reem Mori and uh, we head to Japan. Please uh, read the floor is yours. Thank you.
เฮ้ยฮ่า I forgot to my to I mean I'm very so sorry about that the, thank you Pavlis and thank you organizers and greetings from Tokyo to everybody I'm r i m o r i from n a i a t QE Japan Today, in discussing the future of micro credentials, let me start my presentation by echoing your questions, which is Are there official micro credentials in Japan? You know, my answer to it is kind of unclear. Let me explain. As of today, There's no official definition of micro credentials in Japan. Meanwhile, uh, some higher education institutions have already started to provide so called micro credentials individually or by groups based on their own definition. So I'm echoing Mary k a t h l e e n We are in a wild, wild west situation. Therefore, Uh, before you start talking about micro credentials in Japan, you are supposed to clarify what you are talking about. So, this is a micro credentials uh, in this presentation based on my speculation. What I speculate is that one validation of validation of micro credential is in, in between credit and degrees, size wise. Meanwhile, Another variation is smaller than credit. And I also speculate that the function of the micro credential is to formally seal the learning outcomes that are being acquired at various scales and levels beyond the formal macro credential structure. In this sense, we have two kinds of micro credentials in Japan. At different scales. One is smaller than the credit, but bigger than、uh, smaller than degrees, but bigger than the credit. A typical example of this kind is certificate. I put it the, the original、uh, letters for, that, for your convenience. And certificates are issued by higher education institutions through independent programs with the requirement of 60 or more conduct hours. Just conduct hours. It is convertible to credits and legally authorized. On the other hand, the smaller version of micro credential, which is smaller than credits,、uh, is kind of in the early stage of development. And a rare example of micro credential is、uh, such, such, a, such a micro credential is the digital badges issued by the Open University Japan. Which requires three times of 45 minute engagement to earn a badge under the IMS Global s format. It is more independent and innovative attempt being done by several universities, including Open University Japan. Now,、uh, let's change the focus a bit. Even before starting the accreditation of higher education institutions, NIAT QE, the institution I'm working for, was established to award degrees to learners who are not college students based on their credit accumulation. Through this innovative system, we award around 25,000 bachelor's degrees yearly. And we've been in this business in the last 30 years. and Based on our experience in awarding academic qualification in an innovative way for more than 30 years, we have learned that securing trust is essential. So, if you want to promote micro credentials, we need clear workload determinations described in the records because, in terms of micro credentials such as cre、uh, credit and degrees, Common sense may work. But for micro credentials, common sense may not necessarily work. Also, we need to clarify at which level 
the learning for this micro credential has happened. By doing so, uh, we can secure the traceability of learning, which leads us to guarantee the stackability of micro credentials at the end of the day, as Mary Kathleen touched on area, very area for her this today. And uh, with this traceability, I believe we can secure the authenticity of micro credentials themselves, uh, which can be uh, utilized in places like uh, labor market and ensure opportunities for learners to earn a larger chunk of credentials like credit or degrees. And to clarify from where a micro credential comes and to where it takes you, I guess qualification framework may help. Of course, we have already heard about a qualification framework from uh, Christina. And as to NQF, I believe we will talk about it uh, a lot later. Now, uh, the discussion about on NQF leads us to the another question. Is there an official NQF in Japan? I'd like to conclude my presentation with this question. Uh, well, uh, technically, my my answer is no. However, that's a good news. We have in, uh, disclosed an tentative version of education pro qualification framework quite recently. It has been proposed by the research department of my institution at QE. This, this hasn't been legally compacted yet, but you can visit our website and your feedbacks will be most welcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, now I suggest that uh, we go to Europe and uh, I would ask Esther uh, to present uh, the European framework. Thank you, Esther. Uh, good morning, good night, good evening <laughs> to everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? Can you see you? okay the yeah. presentation? Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for, for being here today with all of you. I, I must say that it is very challenging to, to be the the like the last speaker after uh, previous excellent uh, presentations, because I, I think that there are some ideas that are in my presentation that has been already set, and I will try to skip and not repeat uh, a, a lot of the, the ideas. Okay, so yes, I, I try to answer the question, three main questions. Uh, some of them have been uh, discussed and presented before. What are my credentials? why are so relevant and especially why we're so uh, necessary in the in our region in Catalonia which is a region in Spain and which is the aim of the project we were working with because this is a very special and a specific experience and that's why and I think that that's why I'm, I'm in this seminar today with all of you and and finally I would like to focus on how was the implementation and which are the main ideas linked to the quality assurance. Okay, so uh, previous speakers have said uh, or provide a general definition of what are micro-credentials here. I try to show the UNESCO uh, definition or the European approach to micro-credentials. And basically uh, the main idea is that they are uh, small volumes of learning. There are different characteristics that uh, here you can see some of them that are collected and included in that European approach to micro-credentials. So quality assurance is something important important from the internal but also from the external uh, perspective. It is really important to have in mind that micro-credentials should um, 
be aware about the workload, the qualifications framework, the public information, those elements that has been already said and, and explained. Uh, Micro-credentials should provide this flexibility um, for, for the learners. And especially, it's really important when talking about the professional uh, training and the academia. And that's, that's the main work or the main idea of the project I'm, I'm going to present uh, right now. It is really important to have the learner in the middle. It is really important to have the feedback of the learner. Recognition, we have already been talking about the recognition, but it's not only the recognition in, in the formal education. It's also really important to have the recognition coming from the labor market because uh, we have to bear in mind that I'm going to talk about from the perspective of uh, heavy micro-credentials, which are um, necessary for the labor market. So they've got their purpose of for reskilling and upskilling of the workforce. So why was so relevant uh, micro-credentials in, in, in our region? This experience, uh, we've got um, a demand in 2020. At the moment, it is really important to say that there wasn't any clear definition of what was a micro-credential. So in this context, we've got uh, the Barcelona Digital Tunnel, which is a hub of public and um, um, private organizations with the aim of analyzing the gap of the digital skills in, in, in our society. And they uh, found that there was a need of uh, having more specialized uh, vocational training for, for the workforce. So they've got this uh, idea, they, brung, they bring um, um, that need to the Catalan government. And then the different ministries of the Catalan government began to work on how to uh, give an answer to that need. So in this project, we've, we've got different uh, ministries involved, the, employ the Public Employment Service of Catalonia, the Continuous Training Consortia, but also the Ministry for Higher Education. And obviously, as there was a need of having a more specialized training for, for, uh, for people, for the employment, um, it was thought that higher education institutions could play an important role. Um, and um, at the same time, the agency as, um, uh, as the one responsible for the external procedure was also involved in, the, in, the, in, in this project. Um, it is important to say that uh, the vocational training in, in for the, this professional um, for the professional level market, it's really focused on levels uh, under the bachelor or master levels, okay? Levels six and seven of the EQF are linked to the bachelor and, and, and master level. So uh, at that moment, there were very few training really focused on master, uh, bachelor and master level. So that's why here the higher education system um, has a, a lot of uh, importance. So um when we began to work in this in this project in 2020 we found a lot of challenges the first one i have already been said um, um there wasn't a clear definition of what was a micro credential it was really a, a challenge to 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 have a, a good coordination in between different um ministries uh the the employment service has a special language. Uh, it's quite different from the higher education system language, different procedures, different ways of doing things. So we, we try to focus on, uh, on having uh, and, and adapting the procedures and, and understand what was the meaning uh, for different concepts in, in the different uh, ministries. Another um, question that raised at that moment if, was if higher education uh, institutions were so uh, fast or fast enough to provide the answer to the labor market. As all of you know, that tertiary education, sometimes the academia is not so fast because they, they think a lot and they've got uh, maybe really complicated procedures. So that was another um, element to take into consideration. And obviously, uh, one of the, the benefits of that project was that higher education uh, system can 
uh, being seen as a provider of vocational training for employment, that in this case, those courses were subsidized by the public employment system. So it was really important in the project to have professional qualifications in the occupation delivered by higher education institutions, it was really, really important that those short learning programs that were designed responds to the needs of the labor market. Um, and as I'm going to see, we, we have been working with three different areas and uh, this pathway between it, this flexibility and pathway that was um, uh, provided between the higher education and the professional system. Okay, so um, during the, the experience we've got, we work with some short learning programs uh, focused on the ICT field, the renewable energies and the automotive and sustainable mo um, mobility. The big ideas of those um, short learning programs, I have already said, is the strong applicability. They are, uh, they belong to level six and seven of the European qualifications framework, bachelor and master levels. They could have between four and 30 ECTS. They could be recognized in the official degrees in the formal education. And we only focus on higher education institutions. So the alternative providers were outside of the scope of this project. So focusing more on the quality assurance, we decided to, to, to work with the ex-ante evaluation at program level. This is something that it's not really uh, the best option, uh, but in this case, we have to adopt that uh, procedure due to the particularities of the public employment service procedures that needs uh, to have a, an exempt evaluation at program level in order to, to get the registration in the national catalog of professional qualifications. But I have to say that the, the agency ACU Catalunya has moved uh, forward. Right now we have reviewed our procedures and we have uh, introduced in the institutional accreditation focus on the certification of the internal quality assurance system. And we have already included in that methodology, the evaluation of line of learning, micro credentials and other types of, um, of uh, continued uh, education. So yes, uh, later on, as there's something more special for lessons learned, I, I will stop here just to, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Esther. And uh, thank you all for uh, your presentations. And uh, you, you, you presented um, the different frameworks and also <clears throat> the, the need to have a clarification in the terminology and the understanding what uh, micro credentials are. So that was, I think there's a lot uh, to get uh, out of uh, these uh, presentations uh, already. And um, if you um, if you allow me, I would like to uh, to continue with the, the first question that relates to uh, the process, the process um, used for exploring or introducing quality assurance of micro credentials, the the the, the how to, um, how have you managed to 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 introduce quality assurance in micro credentials? Um, Christina, would you like to um, to say a word about about this? Yeah, you're muted. Yes, yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, I have a very short uh, slide. So if I can, uh, I can share my screen with you. Hmm. Oh, okay. Oops. It works. Yeah, it works. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, actually, we have this uh, action plan in place. Um, well, so far, we interviewed the, the providers, but those are, the, you know, mainly the uh, big, either the big providers or the academic providers. Um, so we want to have a more, uh, you know, a larger scale of uh, survey among the stakeholders to understand their views and also what they need to see, uh, what should be included.
the uh, microcredential framework. And um, with that, then probably we go for the uh, policy development to make the uh, to define the microcredentials and also the rules. Um, then the next step is to um, you know the tools. Um, now quality assurance. In fact, uh, we we already have the QA system in place. We have mm -hmm. our accreditation standards. And uh, we think that we should base on the same set of standards. But um, so the, the requirement should more or less be the same, but the, the, the process uh, could be streamlined. So we will look into that direction. And uh, we think that uh, training is also very important. Um, and uh, well, uh, recently we are having a project to develop what we call a digital credential hub, which is like a platform um, to provide all the um, individual learners information. It's like, a, you know, uh, in other places, they call it a credit bank. That means, uh, you know, individuals can have like a bank account to store all their credentials there. So um, that, that is basically what we are planning to do. And uh, since we uh, interview the, you know, the providers and they have different ideas, then we tend to have, uh, you know, some pilot initiatives to uh, test out what uh, they have in mind and see what would be the best way to support okay. them. Okay. Thank okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christina. Can I ask the same question uh, to Mary Catherine, please? There we go. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, so I can tell you a little, little bit about the process and, and where we are in it now. So we, um, we're we still at the development of the proposal phase, and we've really spent the better part of this year talking to all stakeholders. There were key informant interviews to understand what the needs were from the various um, groups, the various stakeholders. We also have, um, unlike in Europe, where there are significant structures in the background that support various components, it's a little less um, formalized in Ontario. So, um, so a lot of what our our discussions were about were about the the coordination of the various components. Despite not being formalized in so many ways, there are many many things that work, and we wanted to capitalize on that. So, understanding what was working and bringing those components together is really what we what we've done. So we hope that um, the proposal goes forward to the government and is um, and is you know integrated into our landscape. That will end up with the formalization of a qualifications framework, whether or not it's integrated into or adjacent to the current national qualifications framework is a political decision, and, and we'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the um, because our model rests very much on institutional autonomy and the current practices of quality assurance, allowing those institutions to do what they do best when it comes to curriculum design, internal quality assurance. As an external agency, we would um, just expect that they would be able to provide us a proposal or their intentions for their internal quality processes. Mm -hmm. And then work with our our current partners that have the um, the digital platforms for credential recognition, the digital platforms for um, for online provision, digital platforms for pathways. We think it's really important to signal where um, where these mm -hmm. micro credentials are being recognized, either for academic or professional purposes. So we're still talking. A lot of what we're doing yes. is talking. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Marika. Thank you. Um, the second question I have relates to the trans the transfer of uh, credits, um, and I would like to ask uh, Ri and then Esther to um, share with us some some of their experience or or questions about this. Ri first, please. Well, thank you. Uh, as to the credit transfer in Japan, uh, if I can think of the biggest issue of it is it's not happening a lot. You know, the Japanese college students have a tendency to stay in the same college that they have enrolled in after high school education throughout the, the, the completion, getting the degrees. So the, the we have been running the 
degree awarding system based on the credit transfer in the last 30 years, more than 30 years, but the, the, the one of the biggest headache that we have had is the, is the, the, the challenges to convince the society, not just the value of degrees based on credit transfer, but what, what the, the idea of credit transfer per se. So, mm. so, in, so ready to, the, to today's theme, you can expect bigger, if not the same amount, uh, challenges for micro credentials. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Esther? Yeah, that's a very challenging question. And I think that in all contexts or in general, we are discussing about the tra credit transfer. But in any case, I think that in different contexts, we've got very useful tools that can help to do this credit transfer. And I'm, I'm because uh, we've got some different, some standards we've got in, in the European higher education area, we've got the European standards and guidelines, but there are also the international standards and guidelines and other contexts have their own standards. And those standards can contribute to, to, to this common understanding on quality assurance across borders and, and among all stakeholders. And that's something really important because we are going to contribute to this transparency and trust that is needed to do this uh, transfer of credits. Uh, in my opinion, there are other elements that are really relevant when, when talking about the credit transfer. So it's the learning outcomes. It is very important to, to have a real clear definition, the workload and the qualifications framework. And previous speakers have already made references to, to qualifications framework. And here maybe there's a lot of work to do from the policy uh, uh, policymaker levels because micro credentials and lifelong learning not it's not always embedded in, in the qualifications framework. And and are all, there are other contexts for but that, for example, uh, vocational education training is not embedded in a whole qualifications framework, as this is the case of Spain, that it's completely separate. Um, there are other other questions that raise here, and there's a, a question in, in in that one of the uh, participants has already raised, and it's about the alternative providers. What 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 are their role? how those trans uh, those credits are being recognized or transferred to formal or is it ne the need to have this uh, recognition in the formal um education that's another point in our project we decided not to go for uh, the alternative providers we are a public uh, agency that we are really focused on on the high education system including private and, and public universities but anyway and finally and this is also uh there's a big discussion in 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 europe is a is about the of to have a, an official register for for micro credentials that's something that is under mm -hmm discussion so those are the ideas i'm not having i'm not providing uh, answers i'm i'm putting more questions on on your question sorry no that's fine uh just stay still the the, the idea of the register is for micro credentials not for the micro credential providers well everything is under discussion because okay. uh it's still open. Mm -mm -mm -mm. okay okay good thank you esther thank you very much um the I, I would like to um to address now the question of the uh issues related to quality assurance specifically for micro credentials in your context we 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 touch upon that uh, a little bit but uh, if you could elaborate quickly a little bit on this um if i can ask mary kath and then uh, Rie. I can talk about um, some of the, the primary considerations that we're going through um, in our in our discussion. Some of the most controversial elements that, that have come forward. Um, certainly credit recognition is a, a consideration. Um, we think we've tackled that in two different ways. The first way is that uh, through the proposed qualification framework, what, what we're recommending is that there is um, is that there's an alignment of micro credentials with existing qualifications, so that there is um, 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've just lost my screen. Is everybody there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. It's fine. <laughs> I was going to see if I could throw up a slide, but I don't think I'm going to. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is recognize that there are a variety of micro credentials being provided and that they are provided at different levels. And when you want to stack a micro credential into something, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. current activities for prior learning assessment are convoluted for, for micro credentials. And what we're finding right now is that they are not being given credit. They're just the, the prior learning assessment is too difficult to be able to assign recognizable credit to it. So we think that in the assignment of an Ontario micro credential at the apprenticeship level or at the diploma level, at the bachelor's level or at the master's level, it signals the academic rigor that the learning outcomes are aligned with the expectations on the existing qualifications framework, that there are assessments involved and that there's a clarity for both students, employers and academic institutions about what that program's rigor is. So we think that that's one way to tackle the problem of credit transfer. Uh, we think the other way to, um, to tackle it is to clearly signal when a micro-credential is eligible for stacking and elig has eligibility for, my, uh, for credit. And we're doing that, the proposal anyway, is with an OMC plus, just to, hmm. to you know, it's a simple signal to yeah. say that we have pathways for this program to be recognized in a certain program at a certain institution within certain uh, professional associations etc so that students um, have that signal of, of where and how they might be granted credit for it so those are those are sort of the main things that we're thinking about in that realm okay thanks mary Kat. thank you Lee? Yeah, thank you yes thank uh, you. i think i'm going to echo what mary uh, Kathleen just said, uh, even though we ha don't have the official micro-credential system yet in this country, uh, there should be two levels of uh, the focus of uh, quality assurance. One is the, the system level. Uh, of course, we need to have the official definition of micro-credential and, and uh, traceability and stackability, including if it, it can be stacked or not. Uh, should be discussed or uh, taken into the focus of the discussion. And the other level is the assessment at the uh, institutions. At the, probably the, this level of quality assurance, the, the way of doing can be uh, introduced from the regular assessment that we have doing. Uh, in the macro for the macro credentials, live speculations. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, my the, my last question before uh, um, uh, we pick up questions uh, from the Q and A chat box is uh, is about the lessons learned, and I would like to invite uh, Esther and Christina um, in uh, two minutes each, which is also the challenge. Uh, what are the lessons learned about the introduction of the quality assurance framework for micro credentials that that you could share um, with us? Okay. Is yeah. Like to start? Yes. Yeah, Fabrice. Um, well, the, the the first lessons we 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 learned uh, from our experience is that the European standards and guidelines that was something that I, I didn't explain before. It they were really useful and applicable to 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 organize the external evaluation. Um, uh, the European standards and guidelines are well known by higher education institutions, so they, they haven't got any problems to, to, to provide the answers to the methodology and to design the shared learning programs with the main ideas and the main characteristics uh, that should be uh, taken into consideration when talking about the quality assurance uh, perspective. And, and the second idea is that uh, quality assurance procedures should be fit for purpose and agile. And that's the like the, the, the most important uh, lesson learned from all of us because the consortium has to work a lot 
to understand, mm -hmm. as I have already said, and, and to, to design a, a process that it was as easy as possible. And I would like to say that this exam evaluation, it was like the first experience. This is not a, a recommended one because it's very uh, demanding from all, all perspective. So that's why we have moved to the uh, the certification of the internal quality assurance systems, but we have to work more at policy level just to try yeah. to change off uh, some of the uh, procedures that are um, used by the um, um, employment system. But anyway, with this methodology, we can tackle with other type of micro credentials or, or other types of lifelong learning um, um, education that could be provided by higher education institutions. For us, it was very useful and important to really focus on learning outcomes, their assessment, the yeah. definition and, mm. and the level, the qualifications level was something very, very important in, in the in the evaluation. And I would like to highlight from the from this project the high commitment from the higher education institutions. They were really, really interested in participating because they they know that it was really relevant for that society. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Esther. Thank you. Christina? Hi, um, I think uh, in three, uh, I have uh, three points. Uh, first, uh, I mean, similar to everybody's concern, the, you know, the QA, uh, I suppose it has to be balanced uh, between uh, gatekeeping and gate opening. So um, we, we're still finding a way um, to do it. And the second thing we need to take note is uh, about the, you know, the program design. Um, we do think that there is always a risk of um, fragmentation uh, if, you know, uh, especially, uh, you know, when, when programs, um, you know, adopt this uh, modular design and then, um, uh, you know, in the, in the credit transfer process, um, you know, uh, uh, things might, uh, or the um, the program design or the uh, out, uh, learning outcomes may not align uh, in different, uh, at different stages, then there will be, uh, uh, you know, the risk of uh, fragmentation. So we need to take note of that uh, and, and also in our QA process. And then the last point I want to say is that, um, you know, the, I, we think the difficulty in terms of uh, credit transfer is a lack of trust. And uh, is the trust among uh, institutions, um, and this lack of trust sometimes uh, is a result of lack of information. So um, I think this is also an, an area that we want to, uh, we will work on to provide uh, more detailed information about programs, so that they mm. will know exactly what uh they you know uh, uh, the the evaluation could be uh more detailed and uh, the the process will be easier so thank you yeah. thank you very much krista right thank you thank you all thank you very much uh, and uh, i will uh, uh, now open the floor so virtually because we're using the chat box uh, and uh you have already asked uh uh, some very interesting questions under in the chat box or the the Q and A box or the chat box. So, so yes, if you could if you could please add on questions if you want under the Q and A uh, section. But the first um uh, uh the first question uh, we have and it's also in the chat box. I saw that several times. Uh, it issues related to uh, the alternative providers. Those are out of uh, the classic higher education system that we know, and uh, and uh, the extent to which uh, the the ex the quality assurance agencies uh, should or could regulate or cooperate with the alternative providers to to ensure the recognition of um, the micro credentials. Or should we leave that uh, to them with the risks that uh, you have uh, highlighted uh, already this morning? So it's it's more a comment than 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 a question per se. But um, does anyone want to want to bring some uh, you know some some insight into 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 this about the relationships between the alternative providers and uh, the uh, quality assurance agencies? Christina? Um, 
Thank you. I think uh, we work on the principle of having one stand, one set of standard for all. And um, so that would ensure that, um, you know, the status would be uh, equal and that later on will facilitate the recognition. Um, that's why, uh, you know, under under the QF uh, for accreditation, um, so whether that is a, an academic institution or whether that is a vocational training provider, uh, we have the same um, requirements. We have we use the same accreditation standards, the same process. Um, so uh, the, the the only difference is is the is the level. Um, of mm. course, if uh, the level is higher, then uh, we you know the the kind of uh, evidence that uh, have to be more. So that that would be the principle that uh, we work on, and that I think that is a very important one for later on. Um, um, to facilitate the, the, the recognition of, um, of the qualifications provided by the vocational trainers. Okay, good, 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 good. Marika? I can speak to that one as well, thank you. So, so in our proposal, in, our, in the model that we're, we're you know, putting forward, rather than um, explicitly quality assuring the micro-credentials coming out of alternate providers, the private associations, the um, industry, the employers. What we're proposing is that they link with institutions who hold the license for the Ontario micro-credential so that they can partner as providers um, as long as the curriculum has gone through the internal quality assurance process of the institution so that we can all be you know, certain that there are proper learning outcomes that the assessments are appropriate and aligned and um, you know appropriate for for the programming and that um, that there has been sort of a robust consideration we think that also mm. providers have excellent content knowledge but the institutions yes. also have great curriculum design they have that expertise yes. and so the partnership between them we think is something that really has some potential we also hope that um that industry and employers are going to see value in having their um their micro credentials validated through the license okay thank you thank you very much as, yes. as a representative sorry. of a quality sorry, sorry, assurance, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. very, very quickly <laughs> this is something that is under discussion because and and in our agency, for example, it means that we have to uh, rephrase a little bit the, the aim of, of our agency itself. But uh, this is a discussion in, in the in different agencies in the European higher education areas. There are few examples that some agencies uh, um, evaluate in, uh, from the institutional quality, the institutional point of view, if those alternative providers uh, meet the standards, uh, the same standards as Christina has already said, as another yes. um, institution. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Yeah. Uh, again, I had to uh, use the analogy between the credit transfer and the accumulation of micro credentials because we don't have it yet. And uh, uh, several years, several decades ago, we started to allow the, to accumulate the the learning happened in the vocational schools to get a uh, bachelor's degree because the Ministry of Education allowed them to uh, allow them the, the 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 people who completed the education at the vocational school to transfer to the uh, colleges. So it means uh, uh, that's why I'm always talking about that stackability to the the bigger chunk of credentials. So the question might be if we can see it as a part of higher education or not. I think uh, that is kind of the, the trauma that we are struggling with in Japan. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, there is a question um, on um, the, the, the the fact that micro credentials may challenge uh, university programs, which are often criticized by employers by not being uh, sufficiently aligned with the 
the, the demand, the requirement of the job markets in terms of skills, for instance. And um, we, the, the, and, and, and I think uh, uh, underlying this question, there is the, the question of a risk of, uh, of uh, competition. I don't know, fair or unfair competition, but having more uh, adapted, customized uh, micro-credentials vis-a-vis block programs like you can offer at a university, like a bachelor or, or a master, um, do you think it's uh do you think it, it, you see a risk here or do you think that uh, if we assess properly the micro credentials against similar uh, criteria that may not be such a risk i mean i, I know Esther, you 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 talked about, a lot about the learning outcomes uh, dimension when 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 uh, you you address the micro credentials but uh, what what is what are what are your views on this about this challenge, potential challenge, and how to overcome it. Okay, I'll take a crack at it. Okay. Um, what we are, um, what we're considering is that the institutions um, really are responsible for their quality assurance processes. And we see mm -hmm. that the micro-credential quality assurance process as parallel to the broader process for the program. So having a quality assured micro-credential is one thing that is that asserts the quality of that programming, but how it is integrated into a larger program, a bachelor or a master's, and the possibility for fragmentation can be captured in the standard and traditional quality assurance mm -hmm. process. You know, there can be sort of expectations for, um, you know, uh, residency requirements. For example, in Ontario currently, the in order to receive a degree from an institution or a program, you have to have taken 50% of your credits from that program, from that institution. You know, the institutions can create a similar model where only a certain yes. proportion mm -hmm of a degree or a program is um, able to be comprised of micro-credentials. So quality assurance can support the um, the concerns with fragmentation. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. If, okay. if I may, um, yes, yes, the, mm -hmm. the experience from uh, the high education institutions we've got, it was very clear that they didn't have the the need to to have like a subject and just transform that subject into a micro credential because th yes. that could be a strategy okay but yes. it was really important the rationale behind the micro credential and it re mm -hmm. it was really focused on on labor market so that means that it should be a little bit different of what is included in in another um, degree at ma bachelor or, or master degrees. It was also seen as an opportunity to have learners and have a first experience of learners and get into the 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 university. So it was another benefit that it was seen by by university and and not like having uh, or trying to have a, a, a learner. Um, have mm -hmm. this registration in a in a subject to do to do that uh, specific uh, or to achieve those specific learning outcomes. I think that if uh, at the end, if this is the strategy, I think that we yes. will fail as a whole, as as the university, the purpose of micro credentials, etc. I think that the my my feeling, because this is a personal opinion, is that none of the different stakeholders are interested on, on doing this because the aim is really focused on, on providing a very quick answers to, to, the, to the labor market. So the question here is how agile will be those providers or, or the mm -hmm. universities or um, higher education institutions to, to provide that, that course to, to, the, to the society? So that's for me the, the the question. Are they going to be so fast to close and open a new one? Are they going to have the resources? Are they going to design? They, they are going to have, they have the procedures. They are going to do it very well. But mm -hmm. they have to maybe um, adjust some of the internal procedures to be more faster. Okay. 
Mm, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and and in uh, in uh, in prolonging this uh, question, uh, do do you think uh, uh, the quality assurance agencies should uh, use uh, the standards they use for institutions of of or having very specific for micro credentials which have not the same uh, the same status and uh, and the label that is confirmed by by an agency is different when you accredite program or a macro credential um and you know and 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 how you you preserve the system as it is or you allow the system to expand and if i quote christina how to balance the gate keeping versus the gate opening so the first is regarding the standards or in your in your institution in your organization uh, like now do you think you would keep the same standards adapted to micro credentials or or uh, putting together you know new standards for micro credentials i think um, um as i said uh because our standards are qa standards and qa are always qa so um uh, we intend to i mean at, at least at this stage we intend to use the same set of standards as we use in all other programs or other institutions. Um, mm. But as I said, uh, the, uh, we can always um, streamline the process to make it uh, faster. And also uh, in terms of collecting uh, evidence uh, uh, to prove uh, meeting those standards, um, we can always have variations uh, uh, depending on the type of programs. But having the same standard, meaning uh, that uh, we are working on the same, you know, the same platform, the same level, and so uh, to ensure the same recognition um, um, later on. Okay. Okay. Any other reaction? Okay. Um, good. Uh, in your reflection, um, uh, in your organization or through the project that you're having on micro credentials uh and we see the the, the diversity of uh, um uh, of, of concepts and and even the terminology is not is not uh, stable today um uh, do you think uh, would, do you consider uh other Types also of credentials like badges or you know the professional certificates that are more or less connected to micro credentials. In some countries they're look alike, but others they're specific. But the question is, we are entering the or we are in the digital era, you know, with lots of, of alternative uh, credentials, including micro credentials, but also without these badges and also professional certificates in others. So, in your reflection, do you consider them at the whole, or do you have? You know, to specific have specific uh, um, reflection on micro credentials. Christina. Yes. Um. As I said, uh, we are we are having another project to develop um uh, what we call a, a digital credential hub, um, which is actually a block uh, a blockchain uh platform for um, individ individual learners to, uh, uh, to store their, their credentials. So it could be any kind of credential. And the, the purpose is to create a, a personal learning profile so that uh, they can share with uh, employers and also offer institutions if they go for further education. Okay. Ray? Ray? Yeah. Uh... Every time we talk about micro credential, we talk about uh, the digital badges, uh, mm -hmm. probably because the varieties of size of learning differs from credential to credential in terms of micro credential. And uh, so the paper documents are, are too, too small or too mm -hmm. uh, incapable to, to talk about the micro credential. That, that's why I guess. And, uh, the, what is what happening now is, I guess, the competition between VHS and beta systems of videotapes. You know, who can conquer the market first uh, in terms of the digital budgets is uh, the, the 
the point of competition from the viewpoint of Japanese uh, situation now. Okay. Just a comment. Thank you. Marika? Um, I guess our conversation our conversation around here is with regard to the fact that there are digital badges, there are nano degrees, there are micro degrees, there are MOOCs, there are so many different opportunities and learning opportunities for students um, that for our purposes, that will continue, but we have the opportunity to be precise about what we understand a micro credential to be. And, yeah. and by giving it the label Ontario micro credential, it has expectations that yes. sort of allow for the other range of activities, the digital badges, et cetera, et cetera, to continue to be available to students, but just sort of recognizing what the boundaries of what a specific um, Ontario micro-credential look like. Okay, good. Um, dear participants and uh, dear panelists, uh, we're getting closer to uh, 10.30. European time, but uh, we are we are need now to wrap this up. Uh, so um, it seems that we have a, a long way ahead of us with micro credentials. And so um, uh, first, I would like on behalf of Kwahi thanks the panelists for your valuable contributions to our conversation uh, uh, today, and also all the participants for first for being with us today and also for uh, sharing information uh that i can see in the chat in the chat box there are lots of good information about legislations national frameworks and thank you thank you for for for, for this so uh just a couple of information uh, concerning the follow up of, of all of this so uh, the questions that have been unanswered today, we'll, we will try to address them within three weeks, as we usually do with the inquiry talks. The PowerPoints, all the slides uh, and the recording will be available uh, very soon. And also we will collect the links uh, that are uh, uh, um, you know, shared with us uh, uh, today so that uh, you have a, a consolidated uh, in, in information same thing, and, and one in, in in one place about these frameworks and also the frameworks that uh, have been presented uh, uh, today in legislations and also quality standards so you will find them in um, in one place also uh, i would like to remind you that we will host the same inquiry talk for the american continent caribbeans in latin america on the 6th of october so it will be exactly the same but we will accommodate uh, um, uh, the timing of uh, of our uh, uh, american uh, uh, colleagues and to avoid to wake up at three o'clock in the morning like america is doing today and um uh, we are we are very very pleased to have this discussion uh, uh, with you and um, I, when I see the diversity of the participants, I mean, I can't quote all the countries, uh, but uh, we have Barbados, Romania, New Zealand, Mongolia, South Africa, lots of uh, European countries. That is uh, uh, demonstrating that uh, we are a truly global community and that it, we, we are here uh, with you, for you, and uh, very pleased to reach out and uh, stay in touch. So have a very good evening, afternoon, morning, day. And um, looking forward to uh, uh, discussing further with you on this topic and other quality assurance topics. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, dear participants. And goodbye. Thank See you, organizer. Thank you, Fabulous. Thank you.